Okay, so I want to welcome you all back for the last stretch of the marathon. Our two-day conference collapsed into a single day. Um, this panel is going to be on systems of power and control of knowledge. And the first speaker is Eveline Washul, who we are very happy to have at Columbia University this year. All right, thank you all for coming. Um, I'd also like to thank Carl Debrizani for this exhibition and also the conference organizers at the Rubin and Columbia for making this conference possible. Um, I'd also like to thank Yendin Rapsel, uh, Taong Yendin Demba, and Karma Delek, and also the late Elliot Sperling for generously sharing texts and helping me th uh, think through various stages of this research. And I would also in particular like to express my gratitude to Christopher Atwood for um, providing important sources uh, in Mongolian language uh, regarding the Cholka. So the theme of this conference and the exhibition it accompanies focuses anew on the role of religion in the court politics of Asia, particularly Tibetan Buddhism's role in models of sacral rulership. One of the most well-known narratives that starkly illustrates the symbiotic relationship between Buddhism and political power is that concerning the priest-patron relationship between the Sakya hierarch Drungun Pakpa and the founder of the Mongol Yuan dynasty, Kublai Khan. According to this popular narrative, Drungun Pakpa gave religious initiations to Kublai Khan three times, as depicted in this 16th, 17th century Tonka painting held by the Rubin. In return, uh, Kublai presented Drungun Pakpa uh, with offerings for each initiation the 13 Miriarchies of Central Tibet for the first, the three Cholka of Tibet, um, the three Cholka of Utsang, Do Du, and Do Me for the uh, second, and a pardoning of a large number of Chinese prisoners from execution for the third. In the first two, Pakpa is presumably granted political authority over specific polities of Tibet in exchange for conferring religious empowerment upon Kublai. It is the second exchange where he is offered the three Cholka that is popularly seen as granting Pakpa political power over the entire realm of Tibet. In this narrative, Sakya, rather than Mongol authority, is foregrounded as the predominant power in Tibet during this period. As popular as this narrative is in later Tibetan writings, many questions remain about its historical basis. In this paper, I focus on an analysis of the meaning of the term Cholka, um, in the context of the Sakya Yuan administration of Tibet. By tracing its etymology through a study of Tibetan, Chinese, and Mongolian sources from the 12th to 15th centuries, I argue that the narrative of the Three Cholka of Tibet and its donation to Pakpa was a later creation by Sakyapa authors that can be better understood as an aggrandized remembering of a glorious period of Sakya history written in a period of Sakya, uh, Sakya decline from power. For the purposes of analysis, this study will take the period of the 1260s to the mid 14th century as a rough time frame of the Sakya Yuan rule in Tibet. Sources used for this study include Tibetan works that were written in the period just uh, prior to and during the early Sakya Yuan administration of Tibet. These include religious histories and royal genealogies, the collected works of Sakya Pandita and Pakpa. Uh, Pakpa himself, and I also look at imperial edicts, Tibetan works dating to the late and post Sakya Yuan period, Sino Mongolian stone inscriptions, and the Chinese official history of the Yuan. During the Mongol Yuan, Tibet was a frontier territory with military administrative units that, at least in the case of Utsang and Ngari, reported directly to the Department for Buddhist and Tibetan Affairs, the Chinese uh, Shunzhen Yuan or its predecessor, the Department of General Regulation. The largest of these um, military administrative units were the pacification commissions, whose jurisdictions, at least in China proper, were, were over a Tao, often rendered in English as a circuit. Each circuit was comprised of two, three, or more routes, or in Chinese, Lu. In 
In the official dynastic history of the UN, we find three different pacification commissions for Tibetan areas named the Dome Pacification Commission, the Dokam, later known as Dote Pacification Commission, and the three roots of Utsang Ngari Pacification Commission. In the foundational studies of Mongol UN administration of Tibet by Luciano Petek and Chen Jingying, both take the three pacification commissions to have had jurisdiction over the three Cholka of Tibet, which would mean that Cholka were equivalent to circuits. However, according to other evidence from the Mongol Yuan period, which we will see, Cholka were equivalent not to circuits, but to roots, the Chinese Lu. In light of this, Utsang, Dome, and Dote would, would not be Cholka, but rather the larger unit of circuits. Petek, in fact, acknowledges that elsewhere in the Yuan realm, the Cholka were indeed equivalent to a, a root or lu. However, he argues for a case of Tibetan exceptionalism, where they were instead equivalent to a circuit or a dao. Because the Mongol system of administration was sometimes adapted to the local conditions of its territories, variations such as these were a possibility. Yet convincing evidence to support this has not come to light. The term Cholka is recognized by Tibetan authors to be a transcription of a Mongol word introduced into Tibetan during the time of Kublai and Pakpa. For instance, in the collected works of Gomang Kensur Ngawang Nima, a 20th century author citing 18th and 19th century sources. Paul Pelio, in his 1930 study, also finds that the, the Tibetan word Cholka is a transcription of the Mongol word, word Jolga. Since the term Cholka originates from the Mongol Jolga, it is supposed to, um, uh, and is supposed to be from the time of Pakpa and Kublai's priest-patron relationship, it would seem that the term, the Tibetan Cholka, could be found in Sakya Yuan period texts as a common geographical concept of the period. However, my, my study consulting sources from roughly the 12th century to the first half of the 15th century is marked by, um, oops, sorry, is marked by a surprising absence of the term Cholka until quite late in the Sakya Yuan period. In other words, well after the lifetimes of Pakpa and Kublai. It does not appear in works written just prior to or in the early period of the Sakya Yuan. It is notably absent from the collected works of Pakpa himself. Even in the imperial edicts known as the Shalu documents or other imperial period edicts, uh, we don't find the term Cholka. Of interest is that within the Shalu and other Yuan period imperial edicts, we do find the term Xuan Wei Si, uh, a Tibetan rendering of the, the Chinese pacification commission Xuan Wei Si. Thus, we have imperial edicts and other documents addressed to the Utsang Ngari pacification commission, as well as to the Dokam pacification commission. But we do not have any mention of the term Cholka in these official documents. Among the, the works uh, examined for this study, the, the earliest instance in which Cholka appears is in the Testament of Tai Si Tu Chengju Gyeongzin, uh, which is dated, it's dated to the end of 1361 at the earliest. The work is an autobiography of the very figure who brought about the downfall of Sakya Yuan rulership in Utsang and Ngari. In this work, we find the, the phrase Pe Cholka Sum, the, the, Cholka, the three Cholka of Tibet, but the actual area it refers to is unclear. The passage in which it, it appears describes the visit in 1345 of Situ Dharma Gelsen and his entourage to conduct a chesel, which some have taken to be an assessment of lands and populations to, dis, to determine taxes. Um, and they do this of the three cholka of Tibet, among other tasks. Immediately following this mention, only matters concerning um, uh, Uzang and Ngari are discussed, uh, which leaves one to wonder if the three Cholka in this context simply refer to the aforementioned re regions. After all, uh, there were indeed three roots or Lu consisting of Uzang and Ngari under one pacification commission at the time of the author's writing. In the study by Pelio cited previously, he also finds that Jolga, the Mongolian Jolga, corresponds to the Chinese administrative unit Lu, or root. Some of the earliest attestations of this are by its transcription in Pakpa Chinese bilingual inscriptions. Christopher Atwood kindly provided references for um, a 1314 Pakpa Chinese inscription, 
where Zhang Di Njoga is rendered in Chinese as uh, Zhang De Lu, and also in the 1321 edict of Dharmapala's widow, where Bao Ding Joga is rendered as Bao Ding Lu. Uyghur Mongolian evidence further attests Joga to be an equivalent of the, the Chinese administrative unit Lu during the Mongol Yuan period, as we can see from these following examples uh, from 1346 and also 1362. Um, as uh, Christopher Atwood also pointed out to me, the larger administrative unit of the Chinese term Dao or circuit also has an attested equivalent in Mongolian, where it is simply transcribed as Dao. Um, based on the evidence in Mongolian, it is clear that, um, that, the, that Jolga were equivalent to Lu, while the larger unit of the Chinese Dao was transcribed as Dao in Mongolian. It was this unit over which the Pacification Commission had jurisdiction, not the Cholga or the Lu. In this light, the Pacification Commissions of Wu, Zhang, and Gari, uh, Do De and Do Mei would have each been comprised of several Cholga or, or roots. We thus have strong evidence that the Cholka Sum, uh, the three Cholka during the Sakya Yuan period, were not Wu, Zhang, Do De, and Do Mei, but the much smaller areas of Wu, of Zhang, and Gari. Furthermore, even if we take the three pacification commissions identified by Petek and Chen to be our three Cholka, their establishment from 1268 to 1292 would mean that only one, or at most two, of the Cholka were in existence during the, time, uh, during the lifetime of Pakpa. Yet, according to later Tibetan narratives, Pakpa received all three from Kublai as an offering for the second of three initiations he bestowed on, on Kublai. In sum, given the absence of the term Cholka from works contemporaneous with the time of Pakpa and Kublai, the attested equivalence of the Mongolian term Jolga with the Chinese term Lu, and the historical improbability that all three Cholka existed during Pakpa's lifetime, it is quite likely that the narrative of Kublai granting Pakpa the three Cholka consisting of Utsang, Do De, and Do Mei was a later creation. Among the works consulted for this study, the earliest appearances of the narrative of Pakba Kublai and the Cholka Sum are notably found in, a 15th, in, in two 15th century works by Sakya figures connected to Daklung Monastery in Zhang. Daksangpa Benjo Sangbo's Gyapu Yiksang, the Chinese and Tibetan archives, and Daksang uh, Lokza Sherab Jinchen's Lineage of Sakya. In Benjur Sambo's Chinese and Tibetan archives, we finally encounter the familiar narrative found in later works. And uh, a summary of the relevant passages is as follows. Because of the, priest, uh, the patron-priest relationship formed between the Mongols and Sakya, Pakpa went to the Daidu Palace in China three times. Kublai and the royal family thrice received the initia initiations for the three tantras, specific to the Sakyapa. For the first initiation offering, the 13 myriarchies of Utsang were given, and it goes on to list uh, each of these myriarchies. For the middle initiation, the three Cholka of Tibet were given. From Ngari Glungtang to Sok Lakyao, the Cholka of sublime religion. From Sok Lakyao to the bend in the Machu, um, uh, the Cholka of the black-headed people. From the bend in the Machu to the white Chinese stupa, the Cholka of the horse. For the last initiation, according to the orders of the Lama, in other words, Pakpa, a great pardon was given, thereby freeing from execution many tens of thousands of Chinese. Here, the narrative is much more elaborate, and we also have a clear definition of the three Cholka as well as de delineations of its boundaries. Furthermore, it is directly linked to the priest-patron relationship between Pakpa and Kublai. However, in Daksang Lotsawa Shera uh, Jimchen's lineage of Sakya, we find a different version of this narrative. According to him, three offerings were given in return, not for three initiations, but for the creation of a new Mongol script, later known as the Pakpa script. In return for this script, first, the title of Wende Shekye was given. For a middle initiation offering, the Pe Choka Sum were given. Lastly, a great pardon was given to Chinese prisoners. Uh, thus, even at the end of the 14th century, the narrative of Kublai's offerings to Pakpa was still in flux. Oops, sorry, forgot about those. 
So the Sapia UN administration of Tibetan areas was a process that developed, changed, and unfolded in the course of over a century. Um, the administrative units governing the areas later called the Cholka Sum um, were likely not even fully established during the lifetime of Pakpa. Instead, what seems more likely is that as an, admin, as an administrative unit, Cholka in Tibetan areas was indeed equivalent to the root, as it was elsewhere attested in the UN realm. While the term does not appear in official documents, it begins to emerge in Tibetan texts toward the end of the Sakya Yuan period. Its usage in these texts may be interpreted as referring to U, Tsang, and Ngari. The narrative of Pakpa Kublai and the three Cholka consisting of U, Tsang, Du, Du, and Du, Mei does not emerge until several decades after the fall of the Yuan dynasty, sometime in the 15th century, and more than a century after the lifetimes of Pakpa and Kublai. It is also worth mentioning that throughout the Mongol Yuan patronage of Tibetan Buddhism, the Sakyapa were never the sole recipients of imperial attention. There's no doubt that the Sakya hierarchs enjoyed unprecedented status in the Mongol Yuan court, as seen in their exclusive tenure of the imperial preceptor uh, post. But in 1292, not long after Pakpa's death, an aging Kublai appears to have offered Pakpa's own imperial preceptor seal to Ugenpa Rinjimpel, a master of the Drukpa and Karma, uh, Karma sects of the Kagyu school, even though the Sakyapa Drapa Oser already held that position. Furthermore, towards the late Yuan period in 1337 and 1361, the third and fourth Karmapas are recorded as giving Kalachakra initiations and teachings to the Mongol imperial court. Thus, the Sakya, uh, the Sakya primacy in the Mongol court was never a done deal. In fact, the very model of the priest-patron relationship that was adopted by the Mongols came from the Tongit court, where it involved Tibetan clerics belonging to the Kagyupa subsects. As Eliot Sperling has well established, Kagyupa clerics figured prominently in the Tongit court of the Shisha, were superseded by the Sakyapa in the Mongol Yuan court, but once again rose to importance in the Ming court. It should be a point of interest that this narrative elevating the role of the Sakyapa was written by two Sakya figures in the decades after the fall of their sect from political power. It is in this light that we should view the narrative of the three Cholka of Tibet as an offering from Kublai to Pakpa, as a rewriting of history by those who were once powerful to secure and elevate their place in historical memory. Thank you. It's my pleasure now to welcome William Dewey of the Rubin Museum of Art and also to thank him for his significant role in organizing this event. Those of you up front know how much work he did, but for the rest of you, William did uh, a lot of heavy lifting to make this conference happen, so thank you, William. Yes, this is the one. Um, so thank you, everyone, and thank you for coming. Um, so the subject of my talk is Taranata's History of Buddhism in India, um, and Taranata's historical scholarship, how he conceives of an ideal Buddhist ruler, and how he takes inspiration from the Tibetan politics of his own day. Um, and keep in mind my background, although I work at the Rubin Museum, is not in art history, but rather in religious studies. Um, so first of all, a little about Taranata to situate his place as a Tibetan scholar. Taranata was born in Tsang in 1575 into a lineage descended from Ra Lotsawa Dorje Drak, one of the early translators of Indian tantric texts. At a young age, he was brought to Chilung Jantse Monastery, a large Jonong monastery, having been recognized as an incarnation of a previous Jonong master. He received a complete set of philosophical teachings and initiations important to the Jodong tradition, especially Kalachakra, from a number of Tibetan teachers, but also the Indian yogi Buddha Gupta Nata, at least according to his biography. After Taranata was enthroned as the lineage holder at Jonong Monastery in 1588, um, he made it his mission to revive the Jonong tradition in particular, the philosophy of its founder, Dolpopo Sherab Gelsen, as well as his controversial Shentong view of emptiness. 
1608, Taranata wrote a history of Buddhism in India, the Gyakar Chuchum, the subject of my talk, covering the great masters of Indian Buddhism against the background of the Indian royal genealogies. Um, he wrote another, a number of other works on the history of Indian Buddhism and was noted for his Indological and Sanskritic scholarship. Other writings of his included exegeses of the Kala Chakra and systematizations of the Shantung emptiness philosophy. All in all, he was a very learned man, especially regarding the Indic origins of Buddhism. Sorry, that was my first slide. But there he is. Um, so Taranata was no ivory tower scholar, but he was intimately involved in his era's political contests. The Desis of Tsang had established themselves as the dominant power in Tibet after 1565, and that's the Shidgatse Dzong, their fortress. They were not directly connected to a religious sect or an imperial lineage. I mean, directly connected to religion in the sense of um, their family running the monastery or being a tulku like the Dalai Lama. But still, they were generous patrons of monasteries and had links with a wide range of schools, including Taranata's own Jonangpa, as well as the um, Nyingma lineages and the Karmakagyu school, which they're best known for. Taranata and the Jonangpa's um, were on the side of Tsang in their many political struggles. And Taranata had a close relationship with the rulers of Tsang early on. Um, so he had been doing many rituals for the Depa or Daisy of Tsang from 1595 onward, like doing rituals to counteract black magic, um, attempting to cure Desi Punsak Namgyal's smallpox by lending his tutelary deities. From 1603 to 1621, military conflicts took place between the Tsang region and the Gelugpa forces of the U region. Um, this began in 1603 with the Tsang invasion of Lhasa, which followed mutual accusations of disrespect between the Dalai Lama and the Karmapa and other Kagyu Lamas. As a result of the war, the Mongols took the side of Geluk and occupied Lhasa, and their presence was greatly feared by Tsang. In 1604, the war reached the region of Jonang. After Taranata received a vision of Dolpopa and prayed to him, it is said that Jonang Monastery was not destroyed as feared. Um, the Tsang forces were initially victorious in these early stages of the war and expelled the Mongols from Lhasa. So throughout the war, Taranata frequently performed rituals against Mongols, the Mongol repelling, so that Tsang could defeat their enemies, although he didn't give much overtly political advice. So at the time Taranato wrote the history of Indian Buddhism, these military conflicts were still ongoing. Um, according to David Templeman, who's chronicled Taranata's involvement, quote, Tibetan prelates have often allowed themselves to be drawn into their patrons' webs of deceit and have lent their authority to suspect practices such as those of the legitimation of their rule, because he was asking why didn't Taranata intervene to stop these wars. Um, and it's clear that he, Taranata received many benefits by supporting Tsang. Um, he received gifts of monasteries, Takten Domchu Ling. Now, I would argue that Taranata may not have had any high-minded pacifism to begin with, as far as seeing these wars as unjust, but rather seen the military victory of his patron as essential to the survival of the Jonangpa tradition, the true Dharma, as he saw it. Now, turning to the history of Buddhism in India. Um, Taranata wrote his History of Buddhism in India, the Gyakar Chuchung, in 1608. So unlike some of his other projects, such as the um, biography of the Buddha, which he wrote expressly under the patronage of the Desi of Tsang, 
Um, he did not have a sponsor for this project. He wrote it based on his own personal interest. So there's no obvious connection to Tibetan politics. Um, in his dedication, he explains that he's trying to correct scholars' mistaken ideas about India and the origins of the Buddhist Dharma. In the ending colophon, he additionally explains that he wants to instill reverence for the Dharma and the scholars and siddhas who worked on its behalf. Now, even if Taranata intended this work as a hagiography of Buddhist masters, kings have priority as he organizes his historical account. And the table of contents at the beginning explains the royal genealogies around which the work is organized. Five de four descendants of Ajata Shatru, four descendants of Ashoka, 19 members of the Chandra dynasty, 14 Palas, and so forth. And of course, these genealogies don't necessarily match modern historiography. Like he seems to be conflating the Maurya and the Gupta dynasty, and you have historical kings mixed in with kings that are apparently more mythical. Um, but it's only after going through these royal genealogies in the table of contents did he list the Acharyas, the Arhats, tantric teachers, and so on. The majority of his chapters are based on the reign of a king or other political events. Taranata used a wide range of Indian Buddhist sources, including some that are lost today. His sources include Vinaya Shastra and the biographies of the Buddha, like the Abhinishkramana Sutra and the Lalita Vistara. He also consults Tirtika Sastras, as he calls them. Um, these include the epics, like the Mahabharata which contain extensive genealogies of rulers. However, Taranata does not find them reliable, and he's also not interested in rulers that had nothing to do with the history of Buddhism. For more recent history, he relied on more recent works by Indian pundits, including the Buddha Purana of Indradatta and verses by Kshamendra Bhadra, a source that Taranata heavily relied on, but we only know via Taranata's accounts. And he also relied on the oral accounts of pundits. Because I was writing this paper, I included a whole section on his contacts with um, Indian masters of the day, both Hindu and Buddhist. There were apparently a few tantric Buddhist lineages still around. Um, I cut that due to lack of time. Um, but the Indian sources are significant to how he constructed this work. So from a modern historical point of view, he combines legend with actual history. And the later material, although based on oral accounts, appears to be more historically accurate. Um, so in attempting to answer the question of how his work relates to the early 17th century political context, which I believe it does, even though he's apparently just going back into Indian history, it's important to raise the question, is Tar Taranata simply a passive transmitter of sources? Although many Tibetan histories are characterized by the so-called cut and paste method, Taranata shows more originality than this. Um, he had to reconcile a variety of conflicting sources, and this is especially true when he constructs a narrative of Ashoka and the Vinaya councils and creates a coherent narrative, um, attempting to do so consistent with his own tradition and its interpretation of the Vinaya, but also just to create a coherent account um, when confronted with conflicted authorities. So in that, those cases, he can't just copy the sources. Um, his interpretation of lesser known sources, as well as conversations with panditas, also required more originality because these are not settled narratives in Buddhist tradition. Um, in choosing what to emphasize and offering assessments as well, Taranata's own concerns enter the narrative. Although the subject of Taranata's work is dharma rather than politics, the structure of the work reveals the centrality of kings and the state to the dharma. Taranata's attitude toward kingship is revealed in certain tropes that occur throughout the work when he talks about kings. 
the best kings are those who paid due respect to monks, built temples and stupas and monasteries, um, converted to Buddhism, converted their kingdoms to Buddhism, allowed the teachings of great masters to flourish and helped to resolve disputes within the Sangha. Um, Taranata sees violence on the battlefield and in ritual as justifiable if it is used against the enemies of Buddhism. Um, kingship is not always portrayed in a good light as Taranata recognizes that kings can be arbitrary and cruel to their subjects and enemies. But of course, the harshest blame is reserved for kings who attack the Dharma, usually in support of other religions. And these can be divided into Tirtikas, Hindus, and perhaps other Indian religions, and Malakchas. Malakcha means barbarian, and this religion appears to correspond with Islam. Although he does see inter-Buddhist sectarianism as a problem to an extent. Um, Taranata depicts a centuries-long struggle between the Buddhist dharma and what he sees as false dharmas, backed by kings, armies, and black magic. Um, to Taranata, a great dharma king is, of course, one who pays respect to monks, supports the teaching of the great philosophers and acharyas, and patronizes the Sangha by building temples and monasteries, enshrining relics, and so forth. Ajatashatru, the king of Magadha after the Buddha's death, fulfills this idea by worshiping for five years with all sorts of gifts, 5,000 arhats. And you hear similar stories about many kings. It was said that the early kings were the most generous with the Sangha up to the time of Ashoka. But routine patronage on its own is not enough to be a dark, great Dharma king. Of several Pala kings, toward the end of his narrative, Taranata says, the law was nourished as before, but they were not counted among the seven great Pala kings because they did nothing spectacular. It's pretty routine. Um, however, kings and the resources they control are key to large-scale Buddhist conversion, according to Taranata. So Taranata fulfills the prophecy to decorate the surface of the earth with chaityas containing the relics of the Tathagata, and he converts Asia. And you see the same thing in Sri Lanka and South India, that it, uh, monks go and convert the king, he begins to patronize the Sangha, they're converted to Buddhism. Um, even when Taranata shifts his focus to the deeds of religious masters, um, Dignaga, Shantideva, just to name two, Kings are key in enabling or promoting their teachings. Um, sometimes this happens through debate, like they debated Chankya Acharya. He was so badly defeated, according to the narrative, um, he drowned himself in the Ganga. They also would fight magical contexts with non-Buddhists, and Shantideva did this and won and converted the king. Um, there's a trope of the decline of the dharma, but a good dharma king can reverse this. I'm going to go through quickly so I can get to the best part, which is the <laughs> lecture invasions. Um, and he also notes that great kings and masters make use of magical practices, including tantra, in order to serve the state. Um, and many... Um, famous Buddhist philosophers and tantric adepts used magical means against the Turushkas and other Mlekcha invaders. Ashanga and Chandrakirti are credited with stopping the attacks of Garluk and Turushkas through magical means. At a time when Vikramashila Monastery was in peril, Kamala Rakshita used tantric magic against the invading Turushkas. They plundered the ritual materials as he held the Ganachakra, but the master threw holy water at the Turushkas. Immediately was generated a terrible storm and black men were seen emerging from it and striking the Turushkas with daggers in hand. The minister himself vomited blood and died and the others were afflicted with various diseases." Unquote. He even praises King Sri Harsha um, for his determination to destroy the Mlekcha religion. He invited all the teachers to a masita, maybe a madrasha, he calls it a big monastery of the Malekchas and murders them all. And this is acknowledged to be a sin, but one he could atone for by building monasteries around the kingdom. And he has many examples of royal cruelty involving, um, most strikingly, Ashoka before he converts, but it's important that all of these 
acts of cruelty, including the wrong use of tantric magic, are committed by non-Buddhist kings. Um, however, he seems to be conflating a number of central Asian conquerors. Um, Turushka in the text is just a transliteration of the Sanskrit, Turushka, meaning Turk. Um, it's used pretty interchangeably with Taksik, which um, means Persian, related to Tajik, which kind of evolved as a generic term for whichever Muslims were invading. Originally, it was the Arabs, then it became the Persians. Um, he uses Garlok, which is a common Tibetan translation for Turushka, but the Garloks attacked Tibet, but they never actually attacked India. Um, he also uses Sokpo. He talks about much as the religion of the Taksik and the Sokpo. Not in this case Mongolians, but perhaps the Sakas or Sok Sogdians. But it's interesting because Taranata sees both as acceptable targets of magical warfare. Um, and the religion, too, is kind of a garbled account of Islam. That it originates from turncoat Buddhists in the wilds of Mara. Um, when the founder was a renegade monk who went beyond Tokara or Afghanistan, called himself Mamatar, composed scripture, concealed it in the place of the great demon Bishmalila, and attained magical power by the grace of Mara. Um, so both of these created the Mleksha Dharma and converted the Saidi and Turushka kingdoms. And this had destructive consequences for Buddhism. He sees it as the beginning of the decline of the Dharma. Um, although he also says that this coincided with the Tirtikas or Hindus taking control, as well as some internal conflicts, like Buddhists being led astray by greed. Um, so my overall point is that this narrative of the Malekchas, it wasn't really about the Muslims for Taranata. It could be reappropriated to serve his purposes. As you can see in our galleries, many cultures did. To, like this is Shambhala fighting the Malekchas and the Kala Chakra. Um, but since this is an original work, um, I don't think Taranato was thinking mainly about India, although he was aware of the situation there. Because um, the Tibetans at the time weren't really fighting the Muslims. However, the war between U and Song was quite relevant. He blamed sectarianism for the fall of Buddhism to some extent, and there were many sectarian debates at this time. But more importantly, it was the threat of the Mongols and the tantric means used to combat it. Like the Turushkas, the Mongols are a legitimate target of magical warfare for great Buddhist masters. So an ideal Buddhist ruler would patronize and support the scholarship of someone like him. That's another theme you get from Taranata's narrative. And perhaps that would mean Taranata's own patrons. So thank you, everybody. I'd like to invite Ulan from Mount Holyoke College back to New York uh, to talk on the Yong Ho Gong. Thank you all for being here, and thank you to Carl Williams uh, and the entire Ruby Museum and Columbia for having me here. It's great to be back. And uh, my talk today is about Yung Ko Gong. Uh, in uh, English, we sometimes refer to the Palace of Harmony and Peace. Uh, it has been home for uh, Mongolian Buddhist adherents in all parts of Mongolia on, um, since its conversion into a Tibetan Buddhist learning center in the, 19, uh, in the 1740s. 
in my ongoing project on the cross-cultural Tibetan Buddhist uh, knowledge network, I had a more extensive discussion of the formation of this discursive uh, Buddhist space and his role in broadcasting the Qing imperial imaginary, uh, which was a technique of power that early modern imperial rulers commonly employed. By studying the process through which the former princely residence was transformed into a major Tibetan Buddhist learning center in the capital of Beijing, uh, elsewhere I sought to show that Yunhegong became an imperial Buddhist uh, space and it was essential to the Qing's imperial statecraft and in, and in making a Buddhist inner Asia. Today my talk is to focus on Yunhegong's function as a hub of knowledge production among the Qing's Mongolian uh, subjects to the north in the 18th century. Building upon existing works on both Buddhist knowledge production under the Qianlong Ruins in Beijing and the emergent study of Yunhegong itself, I hope to draw attention to Yunhegong's institutional role in defining and sustaining this Buddhist knowledge network. Recent research on Yunhegong has paid special attention to the roles played by Tibetan Buddhist <coughs> prelates in Beijing. Most of them maintain a residence in Yunhegong in their extended stay in the capital upon invitation from the Qing rulers. Study on his physical appearance has likewise demonstrated that the built environment uh, was imbued with Tibetan Buddhist motifs. I share insights with recent research on the financial operation of this religious institution and many others in Beijing. Generally speaking, uh, temples, monasteries of various uh, religion received generous support, uh, generous support from the Qing court. But a more careful study of Yunhegong's day-to-day -day operation has proven that the court was only one of his many sources of income. A handful of correspondence preserved in the published Yunhegong archive revealed that it was the Mongol banners uh, made provisions for their respective monks enrolled in the monastic colleges in Yunhegong throughout its history. It was not unique to the Yunhegong. My research on two major monasteries in southern Mongolian town of Dolanor and the Kumbh Monastery in Amdu has confirmed the prevalence of this practice. Uh, Dolanor is uh, the red triangle on this map. Precisely because of the incessant financial and letter exchange co connections, Tibetan Buddhist monasteries remain deeply entangled in Mongols' social life. The flow of provision and letters create an alternative space that renders the physical limits of the cloistered monasteries more powers. Meanings and significance of objects transmuted as they were mobilized in new regimes of knowledge making. Today, I will discuss how the movement of Buddhist assemblage, including texts, people, and practices, constitute a unique Mongolian Buddhist world in the Qing's inner Asia. A figure today I will focus on, um, he, his life epitomized such knowledge-making process. Um, his, his name is Lobsan Tsujin. Um, he is from the turquoise circle place, southern Mongolian town of, uh, region of Chahar. His prolific writings in Tibetan, translation of the Buddhist texts into Mongolian, and sponsorship of Buddhist text printings earn him the venerated title of Gushie among his fellow country countrymen in southern Mongolian region of Chahar. Whether referring to specific institutionalized Buddhist learning, Gushie is a form of address defining one's intellectual achievement. Then how did Lobzang Tsujim came to be known as the Gushie of the Chahar region? What does his life tell us about the system of knowledge, system of power and control of knowledge in the Qing Empire? But first, who was him? At the age of 11, he took a novice vow with his uncle, with whom he began to study Mongolian and Tibetan language. When he turned 17, he went to a monastery in Dolanor to further study the Mongolian and Tibetan languages as well as translation. Three years later, he visits the Dolanor Huizhou monasteries again where he was ordained from a leading Gaelic scholar, the second uh, Sergi Lobsang Danbe Nima. That's the figures I listed right here. This Buddhist teacher were perhaps lesser known than his student. He was largely responsible for remaking Yunhegong into a Buddhist center in Beijing, and his main disciple was Emperor uh, Qianlong's Buddhist teacher, the well-known Sir Zhang Jianobidoji. 
This young monk from Chahar spent most of his 20s studying in Yunhegong, where he was so diligent that he only went to market twice in his seven year stay. Among teachers, Lobsang Dan Ben Nima seemed to be close to Jone Nyang Wang Sujin, whom he related and referred to a lot in his writings. The Buddhist by the name of uh, Jone um, Nyang Wang Sujin headed Yun He Gong for closely 15 years before he was entrusted with the task of mediating the orders in the political arena in the last half of a decade. The reigning Tianlong emperors later commissioned him to mediate among interest group in the aftermath of the Gurkha War in 1790s. Chone Nyang Wang Sujim was later recognized as the first Somalian that started a new reincarnation land. After Lobzang Sujim from Chahara returned to his home, he made multiple trips to Dolanur, where he received an audi audience from the sixth Bantan Lama, who was on his way to Beijing in 1780s. Influential Buddhist teachers, as such, formed the intellectual network within which Lobzang Tsujin situated himself in the intellectual network. It wasn't that Lobzang Tsujin was particularly lucky to study with eminent Buddhist scholars like these I just mentioned. Just like him, the hundreds and thousands of young Mongolian monks enrolled in Yunhegong, all the two Dolanora monasteries similarly received teachings from some of the brightest minds in the Buddhist world. The Qing court made effort to bring learned scholars from leading Gallic monasteries in Lhasa. Some of the first cluster of 22 teachers that I have identified who were invited to Yinghe Gong in 1744 came from Drip Gong. Many of them came from Jashi Gong Mount Jashang, which was Drip Gong's oldest philosophical monastic colleges, college and an institutional foundation that gave rise to a circle of celebrated Gallic Buddhist scholars Almost all of them came from Amdu in the 18th century. This institutionalized Buddhist knowledge played a crucial role in shaping the Buddhist landscape in Mongolia, where early Tibetan Buddhist vanguards visited and spent quite a lot of time in the 16th century. But to be noted, not all of them were actually uh, Gallic, but the landscapes are changed in the 18th century. From this map, you can see that Lobzang Tsujim didn't travel very far from his home region, Chahar. He was celebrated more locally as someone who contributed to Buddhist dissemination in southern Mongolia. His limited range of movement seemed to contradict the, talk of my, um, the theme of my talk today, which is about movement. I must say that I was very reluctant uh, to focus on Lobzang Tsujim early in my research and thought that my study of a cross-cultural network got off on the wrong foot. I should look for people who actually travel a lot. But I was curious what gave him his religious um, reputation without spending so much time in most of after Gallic monasteries in Lhasa or Eastern Tibet. I hope to show that Mongolian Buddhists in 18th century Qing Empire had access to Buddhist knowledge through designated Buddhist in institutions like Beijing's Yunhegong and Dolanor's two monasteries, all of which were sponsored uh, by the Qing Imperial Court for educating Mongolian monks in its inner Asia. This Buddhist institution acted as a vector of knowledge making through educating and interpersonal networking. Mongolian Buddhists negotiate their notion of belongings and religious identities without going far away. This said erudite Mongolian Buddhist scholars like Lobsang Tsujim, apart from his contemporaries from Tibetan regions. Scholars from Tibet draw their source of authority from schooling in leading Tibetan uh, Gallic monasteries like the Great Three Seats in Lhasa, Gumbin, or Labro monasteries in Amdu, as well as extensive travels and writings. Mongolian Buddhists, on the other hand, found an alternative path to knowledge in places closer to home. Acutely aware of the importance of Buddhist institution, Lobzang Tsujim returned home, expanded the Chahar Wura monasteries in uh, Chahar, which was no longer in existence where he taught disciples, he translated numerous Buddhist texts into Mongolian, and established print house, printing house. His disciples wrote his Namtar in 1817 uh, in the Tibetan language first, later was translated into Mongolian and printed in the very monastery he renovated. He left behind a collective work of 11 volumes encompassing many Buddhist subjects. 
Like many of his contemporaries, Lobsang Tsujem saw visiting other monasteries and producing Buddhist texts through writings, translation, and printing as an essential mechanism to disseminate Buddhist knowledge. His connection with Gallic knowledge system was no longer the systematic schooling in more recognized massive monasteries of Yuzang or Eastern Tibet, or even the already popular site of Mount Wutai. Instead, textual productions defined his Buddhist identities in a recalibrated political landscape of Buddhist inner Asia. Through a study of Chahar Gesia Lobsang Tujem's life, I argue that what enabled the Qing to form a Buddhist inner Asia was not its political techniques, but through cultivating a different regime of value of knowledge system. Mongolian Buddhists eagerly participated in the process of making a very unique Buddhist knowledge that was unique to both them and the Qing court. Even though my focus today is on the 18th century, I want to make it clear that the writing facilitated Buddhist identity formation was not created by the Qing court, but revitalized with the Qing support. Several scholars have shown that Buddhist practices in Mongolia was heavily focused on textual productions, including translation of Buddhist canon, sponsored Buddhist canon printing, and composition of Buddhist philosophical texts, etc. If anything, I hope to see the Beijing-centered imperial Buddhist production endeavors as part of the Manchu ruler's ongoing effort to gain Buddhist legitimacy from pre-conquest Mukden court to the Qing imperial court in Beijing. Tibetan Buddhist vanguards eastward journey to various often competing Mongolian uh, um, groups has paved the way for mass production of Buddhist art and literature in the 1740s. Additionally, the rise of a print culture in Tibet and China long before the 1740s also enabled these Buddhists to perpetuate the social textual Buddhist community by the 18th century. This was a time when printing became the major form of textual product reproduction among Tibetan Buddhists. Lobsang Tsujim's Chahar Wura Monastery became an important site for printing Buddhist texts in the late 18th and early 19th century. When I started working on my doctoral project years ago, longer than I wish to remember, um, I naturally took the 1740s as a point of departure and sought to look at the broad implication of Emperor Qianlong's initiative in Inner Asia. I still believe the 1740s is crucial to understand the Qing court's statecraft, especially its effort to negotiate a universalist empire but it is perhaps more productive to consider the early Qianlong year as a threshold of a new era with more complex strategies to recalibrate power relations than a starting point of Qing political innovations. The latter approach has portrayed the Qianlong court as responsible for making this unique empire, but in fact it was an inheritance of the early uh, practices that was uh, less organized. The writing facilitated techniques also enable Mongolian Buddhists beyond monastic institutions to articulate their religious belongings in the 18th century. Elsewhere, I have discussed a Mongolian government appointee. He wrote his historical account, compelled lexicon refer references, and translated Buddhist texts into Mongolian while serving in the Qing court. Textual production shaped a notion of belonging as heterogeneous adherents of Tibetan Buddhists were brought together by the Qing. Writing became a defining attribute of Buddhists in a cross-cultural and transnational, a transregional intellectual network in the Qing's inner Asia. Aside from Buddhist texts and people, the multifaceted Buddhist assemblage also included practices. To that end, Lobsang Tsujem compelled manuals, performed rituals and giving teachings. Yun He Gong provided Lobsang Tsujim with institutionalized authority, and that's about the Tibetan Buddhist knowledge, and numerous monks like him in turn established Gallic Buddhism in Mongolian social life, as well as defending themselves as Qing Mongolian Buddhists through the range of Buddhist engagement. The path to knowledge and power did not necessarily lead them to Gallic seat in Lhasa, but nonetheless, they saw themselves, and it was remembered as a land Buddhist within the Qing's system of knowledge making. A final words on knowledge production. Today is a celebration of uh, 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 the life of great teacher and scholar, the late Alex Sparling, 
And it's truly my honor to be here and to be part of the intellectual network formed by so many teachers and colleagues who are in this very room. Thank you. And the last presenter for the panel today is Rika Shaka from uh, a graduate student at Columbia University. Good afternoon, good afternoon. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank Carl and William uh, and everybody at the Rubin and Columbia who made this wonderful event um, possible. I think my slides are slightly out of order, but um, we'll flick through them. Um, I'm going to examine three specific material exchanges that took place between 1780 and 1793. Uh, between the Chenlong Emperor and three very important Tibetan historical actors of the time, um, namely the sixth Benjen Lama, uh, the eighth Dalai Lama, and uh, Doring Denzin Benjo. Uh, and in doing so, I'd like to bring together Tibetan and Chinese archival material, literary and visual materials, into conversation with anthropological literature on gift exchange and the social lives of objects. Um, and I know it's that time in the day, I'm the last paper, but some notes on, on, on method, uh, and um, the slide I have are, you know, three people who've put it uh, a lot better than I have. So if you're bored by the methodology, please enjoy the, you know, these uh, fantastic writers and a Tibetan uh, proverb. So invoking Johann Elverskog's notion of Qing ornamentalism, that Qing rule of Inner Asia was founded on a discourse of class, whereby imperial patronage of existing social hierarchies disguised the reorientation of local political traditions on terms of the Qing court, I will demonstrate that gift giving was central to, configure, uh, to configuring the relationship between empire, imperial center and periphery, and that close attention, by paying close attention to the materiality and literary representation of Qing Gandempon and gift giving, um, it reveals how objects became nodal points where individual imaginations congealed into an imperial imaginaire and where social structures were maintained, albeit superscribed, with the logic of empire. I also contend that the associative power of these Qing baubles stemmed from their entanglement within webs of other objects, people and texts, and that they came to serve as productive sites of identity that shaped notions of subjectivity and empire for both Chenlong and his Tibetan interlocutors. Um, no notes and method continued, I'm sorry. Uh, Partha Chatterjee, none other than Partha Chatterjee, writes that the imperial prerogative lies in the claim to declare the colonial exception. And by this, he means that the power of European imperial formations lay in their capacity to name other political entities in the need of intervention. And while some scholars have argued Qing rule in Tibet was colonial in nature, court patronage of Tibetan Buddhism complicates the conventional notion of the empire as civilizing mission. Rather than imposing a foreign ideology upon their subject populations, Qing rule, as we can see from this lovely exhibit and all the work of these fantastic scholars, uh, was facilitated by working within Buddhist cultural paradigms and with Tibetan lay and religious elites. Uh, scholarship on court patronage of Tibetan Buddhism has been grounded in models of legitimation whereby culture establishes and reinforces power. However, in dealing with the relationship between the Qing and the Gandan Podong, we reach an impasse when it comes to the question of legitimation. Were the emperors true believers, or was patronage of Tibetan Buddhism solely instrumental? Scholars classical scholarship on the gift has also been inhibited by structuralist readings of power as purely sovereign and coercive. For Marcel Mauss, gifts are never actually free, but objects of reciprocal exchange. In the gift economy, then, objects cannot be fully transferred from one owner to another as they can in a commodity economy. Gifts, therefore, always establish relationships or bonds as well as their accompanying obligations to give, receive, and reciprocate. Thus, the act of giving contains within it 
two opposite movements. It is an act of both generosity and violence, of sharing and of debt. To break free of this dichotomized framework of genuine gift and genuine belief, I borrow from Mughal historian Audrey Trushka's approach in contextualizing the patronage of Sanskrit literary production at the Mughal court. Trushka argues that the patronage of Sanskrit literati was a mode of royal self uh, motivated by their self-identification as Indian kings, as kings in an indigenous Indian tradition that preceded them. I, therefore, today, in my presentation, understand Qing engagement with Tibetan Buddhism to be a form of discursive self-representation rather than the quest for an external source of legitimation. So now on to the nitty-gritty, the objects themselves. I follow in Patricia Berger's attentive approach to the vocabulary of gift giving to read the Qianlong's uh, emperor's gift of a cuckoo clock, a Ziminjong or a Chuzokolo, as a break in the conceptual grammar of the exchange between emperors and Buddhist hierarchs. The clock, a cosmopolitan object that inspired wonderment from the Panchen Lama, can be seen as a rupture both semantically as a new mechanical device that escaped easy articulation in the Tibetan language and temporally as a modern technology that had no precedent in the long history of material encounter between the court and Tibetan lamas. This double rupture reinforces the expansive temporality of a universal wheel-turning bodhisattva ruler whose gifts were as much the material instrumentalization of imperial power as they were commodified visions of universal rulership and empire. During his 1780 visits to Beijing, the Benchen Lama and monks from many of Beijing's Tibetan Buddhist institutions performed elaborate prayers for the longevity of the Qianlong Emperor, and in return received a strange and worldly gift. On the fifth day of an elaborate series of gift exchanges, the Penchen Lama was struck by the novelty of a wondrous wheel of time that chimed with melodious birdsong as it struck each hour. In the long lists of gifts provided in the accounts of each of the Penchen Lama's days spent in the imperial capital, the clock is one of the only items to draw any personal comment that interrupts the monotonous structure of the gift register. Mechanical clocks were first introduced to China by Matteo Ricci when he met the Wanli Emperor and presented him with a European design in 1600. Uh, and by the reign of the Qianlong Emperor, as you can see, opulently decorative clocks were routinely presented as part of the culture of ceremonial gift exchange the Penchen Lama was greatly impressed by the abundant gifts he received in Beijing, remarking that it was due to the great compassion of the Manjushri Emperor that all the kingdoms of the world had been brought into a peaceful state, and the teachings of the Buddha, especially those of Tsongkhapa, have prospered. That in your 70th year, I, but a lowly Lama, have had the opportunity to gaze upon your golden countenance and meet noble officials, see distant lands, and meet the local populace is surely down to your incomparable benevolence. And I'd like to point our attention to the far, your far, the, the item on your far right. Um, this is not the item itself. It's the closest thing I could find to it. One of the Penchen Lama's own gifts for Qianlong, um, an, a Mughal sword and a Mughal matchlock uh, pistol, and much, uh, you know, items that were much treasured at the Qing court as well uh, as invoking a kind of a eschatological uh, narrative, as Wen Xingqiu points out in, in, in her book, in a, in a very small footnote, proved that the Benjamin Lama was also uh, quite an adept gift giver. Uh, and you know, as a slight caveat, it is also possible that the Benjamin Lama could have potentially been aware of European clock making, having met with George Bogle uh, in 1775. Um, nonetheless, I argue that the clock here represents an embodied Qing cosmopolitanism that here speaks to Qianlong self-fashioning as a universal ruler with the ability to seamlessly work between and transcend registers of meaning in a given exchange. That is to say, the Qianlong's gifting of the cuckoo clock broke the conceptual grammar of the previous four days of gift giving that was punctuated with the presentations of objects that were meaningful because of their familiarity or resemblance to gifts that had previously been exchanged between Chinese emperors and Tibetan lamas. In many ways, the Benchen, uh, the Benchen Lama's cuckoo clock uh, was an important precedent to the horological diplomacy practiced in the future. Only 13 years after Qianlong's uh, gifting of the cuckoo clock left such an impression on the Benchen Lama, George McCartney would present an opulent 
Francois Justine Vulami clock to the Chenlong Emperor. For the British, the French clock represented the apex of 18th century technology. Yet Chenlong, as a consummate connoisseur and ruler of all under heaven, remained defiantly nonplussed. The clock then was a gift that implied Chenlong's mastery of a new technological vernacular. It was the court reproduction of a European gift that had been repurposed to impress the relationship of sent and periphery on, his most, on one of his most important Tibetan Buddhist interlocutors of the time. The records of the Neiwufu, the imperial household division, show that after 1780, the Chenlong emperor would continue to gift uh, cuckoo clocks uh, to Tibetan Buddhist lamas on at least two other occasions. By February of 1781, Chen Long was writing to the Eighth Dalai Lama, informing him of his former teacher's death. Um, some of you may be familiar that the Benjamin Lama succumbed to smallpox in Beijing. What then became of the Benjamin Rinpoche's cuckoo clock? The clock, along with the rest of Chen Long's uh, luxurious gifts, traveled with a golden reliquary escorted by a military convoy that left Beijing in March of that year and a close reading of the table of contents of the Benjamin Lama's uh, funerary stupa, written by the Eighth Dalai Lama himself, revealed that the cuckoo clock, along with the emperor's other gifts, uh, were interred in uh, the Benjamin Lama's funerary stupa at Dashilumbu. As President Xi Jinping evinces his own vision of Chinese empire in the 21st century, Relics of the Qing Empire uh, have acquired great currency in the art market. In 2017, a jade pebble was sold at auction at Sotheby's Hong Kong for over a quarter of a million dollars. This object was one of, Chen, of the uh, Chenlong Emperor's many birthday gifts to Chambe Jiazhou, the eighth Dalai Lama in 1783. The gilt jade river pebble has been skillfully hollowed into an ornate box with a carved soapstone base. The interior of the pebble bears an extensive Tibetan inscription that records the bestowal of the Edict of Jade uh, to the Eighth Dalai Lama. The text of the inscription is an almost word-for-word -word transcription of the Edict of Jade that the Chenlong Emperor bestowed to the Dalai Lama, along with a jade seal of office on the same occasion. Um, this jade pebble, uh, much like the clock given to the Dalai Lama, is also enmeshed in a web of object, individual, and text. Um, throughout the Chenlong uh, period, we see the persistence of doubling or replication, uh, be it in the establishment of parallel architectural structures like the Potala and Tashilumpu sites, or reproductions of gifts previously exchanged between Yuan and Ming emperors and their own Tibetan Buddhist interlocutors. Close reading of the inscription shows that, Jade, that the Jade, uh, edict serves to evoke the past encounter between Shunzhi and the fifth Dalai Lama. Jade seals had also been exchanged between previous Ming and Yuan emperors and their contemporary uh, Tibetan Buddhist hierarchs. Um, in the inscription, Chenlong directly addresses the Eighth Dalai Lama, recalling the great authority of his predecessor. This was an authority that, in Chenlong's mind, stemmed from the patronage of the Qing court. Um, the Eighth Dalai Lama, who was enthroned in an era uh, when the Ganden Podong governance was mainly presided over by a cabinet ministry under the supervision of a series of regents appointed by Beijing, was to invoke the authority of his prestigious predecessor when he needed to issue important declarations or edicts. Chinese historians have typically read the text of the Edict of Jade as an affirmation of Qing authority over the government of the Dalai Lamas, and more specifically, the conferral of the Jade Pebble as Chenlong's confirmation of a subject Buddhist ruler, historical readings of the Jade Pebble, and the respective roles of Chenlong as giver and eighth Dalai Lama as recipient have, therefore, coalesced into a modern Chinese nationalist historiography where Tibet has been an inseparable part of a multi-dynastic but continuous Chinese political formation. Um, there is a historical precedent to anxious Dalai Lamas invoking the authority of the fifth Dalai Lama, and one such example can be found in the holdings of our own Star Library, where the seventh Dalai Lama settling a high-profile land dispute between two noble families, uh, declines to use his own seal of office and instead opts for the recognizable seal of the fifth. Given that we have no uh, autobiographical writing by the Eighth Dalai Lama himself and that his life narrative was authored by the court-appointed Demo Hutuktu, it is difficult to surmise the extent to which uh, the Jade Edict, Pebble and Seal played into his own self-conception 
of spiritual and temporal authority. But for the time being, I would argue that this example of gift exchange, uh, of, of gifting, uh, re reveals, uh, reflects uh, the Chenlong Emperor's self-fashioning process as a universal Buddhist ruler, and the ways in which he drew on a historical imagination to shape his own notions of Buddhist governance. For Chenlong, the past was a malleable resource uh, for shaping the future, and objects like the jade pebble were subtly potent as they invoked historical memory while reaffirming the relationship between giver and receiver. Uh, I'd like to note here that in life writing, uh, gifts exchanged between Chenlong and Tibetan elites are frequently uh, uh, termed as sure. And sure is an honorific noun uh, for gift, the meaning of which is difficult uh, to convey in English. A sure means to offer, supplicate, or to beg, and re, uh, rasare, literally a piece of cloth uh, or cotton that corresponds to Sanskrit vastra, which means cloth or garment. Uh, the term may have originally been used to describe the granting of a scrap of a Buddhist master's robe to a follower. Um, uh, this ambiguity uh, describes the bestowal of a gift from a superior to a subordinate, forming part of the Tibetan honorific uh, register, or shesa. The implication is, therefore, that the exchange takes place between two individuals in the asymmetrical power relationship and that such an exchange uh, emerges from the benevolence or gutting of the superior. I find the use of sura interesting not because it implies an asymmetry between giver and recipient, however, but because it is first and foremost an interpersonal uh, term. The brokering of empire was therefore uh, heavily reliant on the maintenance of close personal relationships between the emperor and the Tibetan Buddhist elites he interacted with. The language in which gift exchanges are described uh, as personal gifts made out of benevolence speaks to the subtly curated but familiar way in which Chen Long wanted to be seen by his interloc interlocutors. Narratives of Tibetan elites, like Doreen Denzin Penjo, uh, imbue Chen Long with a resplendent physical and compassionate mental. Uh, uh, physical and compassionate mental attributes of Manjushri uh, and reveal the potency of language in the construction of a bond of loyalty. In 1793, uh, Denzi Benjo, during Denzi Benjo, arrived in Beijing to plead his innocence before the Chenlong Emperor. Uh, having suffered an ignominious defeat at the hands of the Gorkhas, uh, Denzi Benjo had been a prisoner of Rana Bahadur Shah uh, in Kathmandu. The Gorkha War had, in many ways, been precipitated by the Shamapas. Uh, Shamapa Lama's designs on the immense wealth uh, bestowed upon his brother, the sixth Benjen Lama, and Dashilog Monastery by Chen Long uh, just a decade prior. As Denzi Benjo waited for his audience with the Chen Long Emperor, he bemoaned, My lonely self has not even a single silk offering scarf to offer the Manju Sri Emperor. Denzi Benjo emerged from the meeting having escaped serious punishment and instead received a generous stipend from the Chenlong Emperor. He was, however, summarily dismissed from his post of cabinet minister and stripped of the hereditary title of Teji that he had inherited from his father. Although Chenlong does not bestow the same largesse he did upon the sixth Benjen Lama and to Arpandita, there are still numerous gifts at play here. Uh, Benji, uh, Denzi Benjo's own release was secured by uh, Ch Qing uh, General Fu Kongan, and his freedom was therefore a gift from Chenlong, the generous stipend, yet another gift. At the same time, Chenlong rescinds the title of Teiji. We see that in these examples of gift exchange, the Doring family emerges indemnified, with successive sons of the family only able to reciprocate with their records of service in governance. A few months after his return to Lhasa from Beijing in 1793, Denzi Benjo's heir, Mingyu Sonam, Benjo is married, and not long after, the family receive an edict from the Chenlong Emperor through the Lhasa Ambans that restores the hereditary title of Teiji and confirms the ascendancy of the junior Doring to the position uh, of uh, cabinet, minister, uh, cabinet ministry secretary. Denzi Benjo commits the transcript of the edict into his autobiography and is infusive in his praise of the emperor's benevolence that allows his heir to follow in his father's footsteps. While my examination of the afterlives of the Benjen Lama and the Dalai Lama's luxurious gifts do not necessarily move us beyond the aporia of the gift, 
During Deng Xiaoping's encounter with Qianlong and his autobiographical inscription of Qianlong's edict follows the script of what Elvis Scott terms Qing ornamentalism. It seems it was therefore the aristocratic elites uh, for whom imperial baubles became the most potent sources of self-fashioning. And in the words of Anstola, sentiment became the substance of governing projects. The imperial logic that would undergird Qianlong's support for Tibetan uh, traditional hierarchies and class organization to a large extent depended on this entanglement of literary and material representations of the aspirations, anxieties, and emotions of both Qianlong and his Tibetan interlocutors. Thank you. going to keep my comments really brief so we can uh, go into discussion, but I just wanted to uh, thank the speakers today and, and everyone uh, who's been involved with the conference, um, again, the Rubin Museum, for, for pulling this together for us. Um, so I, I liked especially Ulan's reference to a, a social textual uh, existence, and I might add to this the, the material aspect of it, right, that we often look at these texts for what they can tell us about history. Um, so if it's the history of Buddhism in India, we're looking at that to see if it's correct or not correct, and, and William talked about some of the problems with that text, but I was uh, completely persuaded by the longer paper. He, he wasn't able to present all of it today, but the, um, the argument that he made that, that Tarnata was really addressing the contemporary king in Tibet and making an argument for how he should be sponsored and how it was justified to uh, you know, use these ritual activities that the, the second panel talked about earlier today as justified um, in, in thinking about protecting his own material resources, right? Jolong Monastery was, uh, was threatened in that way and ultimately lost, right? Um, so much so that we thought it was, you know, that, that scholars thought it was completely lost till they discovered the Jonang monasteries in, in Amdo in the 20th century. And I think the same thing can be said to some degree with Evelyn Washwell's paper, thinking about uh, what the Sakya realized that they had lost when they fell from grace and, and the role that narrating their past uh, has for trying to reclaim some of that power, which was then embraced over time, generation after generation, um, by, by Tibetans who wanted to claim that, that full extent of Tibetan power. And we see this going on today, again, with a, a kind of united Tibet that harkens back ostensibly to the Mongol imperial period. The, the work that Evelyn, I, was, I had always myself felt very suspicious about the, the neat narrative of, of these three donations. And, and people had said maybe they were mythical, but it was really that careful historical work um, that, that documents this, is a kind of second instance, as Jack, uh, David Jackson had done uh, with an earlier edict, an earlier Sakya edict, uh, a second instance of clear, essentially, forgery uh, on, on the part of the Sakya. And then I think, um, Ulan and, and uh, Rika's work uh, is, m let's say, and rather than focusing on you know one particular text and dissecting it, we have this, because of the Qing period and the survival of archival materials, really rich networks of exchange, of sponsorship, and so forth that, that show us the, the human connection to these texts and the material interests that are at stake. So I wanna stop my comments there and, and invite the panelists up to um, take some questions from the audience. Thank you. Does anyone have a question to start us off? Thanks, so I have the all really wonderful papers. I have a question, though, for uh, particularly for Evelyn. 
Um, since that time, uh, when this Cholkasom idea that it included all of Tibet, roughly what we now know as uh, Uzang, Uzang, Amdo, and Kham, since that time, there's never been a single political entity that included all three of those. So I'm wondering, um, uh, do you, have you found in contemporary, or in, in that time uh, from then on, is there, uh, and maybe is there today, uh, a, a way in which people use the idea of Cholkasum to advocate for, to envision a Tibet uh, that is a unified sort of Tibet that brings those three areas together. How, what kind of resonance does that idea of Cholkasum have in later history? Um, thank you for that question. And that's kind of um, what started, the question that started me on this research. Uh, also just uh, because even in the current day, we hear um, the three regions of Kham, Amdo, and Utsang being referred to as the Cholkasum of Tibet. Um, and that made me curious to kind of look at the history of uh, the idea of those three regions as all of uh, Tibet. Um, and um, uh, I kind of have found in my research that uh, previously uh, we see the names Utsang, Dote, and Dome uh, in the kind of uh, Sakya Yuan period, but then later on we see kind of uh, Dote, uh, sorry, not Dote, it's, it's Dokam, Dome and Utsang. And then later on, in the later Yuan, maybe it, it, it changes to Do De. Uh, and then later, even later on, we see the shift to uh, Utsang, Kham, and Amdo. And so it's kind of this replacement of different names for these different regions that, um, and I, the, the sense of what these regions encompass also seems to change over the centuries. Um, but it's, it's a common um, trope of like the, the three uh, regions of Tibet that is e the, that is used in the current day as well. I don't know if that answers your question. Hi, um, thank you so much. I learned so much uh, from this panel, and uh, I, I have a question for Ulan. Um, we uh, are working through, I think, a lot of the same questions and, and issues in looking at networks. And, uh, and I wanted to think through with you the idea of knowledge production. Uh, you talked about this. I think you're locating this in translation and printing, mostly. Um, and, and so I wanted to ask you a couple things. One, uh, with the three monasteries in particular that you were talking about, uh, from my understanding, I, I want to think about the dratsang structure, the structure of uh, 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 faculties, monastic faculties. Um, so, you know, knowledge production can be separate from the reproduction of teaching. Um, but at the same time, um, my understanding is that none of the three monasteries that you mentioned are necessarily uh, centers of of teaching and learning in the, in the sense of being, uh, you know, monastic universities of the fourfold structure, right, that becomes popular at this time. Uh, sutra colleges, tantra colleges, medical colleges, kalachakra colleges. Um, so I wondered how uh, knowledge production, the structure of it, the organizational structure of it within the monasteries that you looked at, um, and with the printing, uh, a question that's still open to me is whether you know woodblock printing at these ma again at these major monasteries, um, and and Yonghogong had that fourfold structure. But I'm thinking of uh, in the medical context, uh, they don't seem to Yonghogong seems to focus more on even within its dratsang on ritual rather than uh, teaching, let's say, practical knowledge as other. Uh, Dratsang outside of Beijing do. Um, so the question of, of teaching practical knowledge is one. And then the question of printing, uh, to me, is a, uh, are these monasteries consolidating and amplifying knowledge, right? Uh, or, are, uh, or are they producing it, right? Are the texts that they're printing texts that they've collected from other areas? Uh, manuscripts, people that they're inviting in, 
or are they actually, you know, uh, dominated by printing projects that are that are primary, uh, you know, people that are writing and producing their own works on site? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, there are so many parts to the question. Um, I'm I'm more curious about what Yunko Gong was received among Mongolian Buddhists, not so much about what he actually set out to do. Uh, that's different parts of the uh, research I'm working on. Um, so if you take a more contemporary, more relevant example would be, we have a lot of colleges in the state have satellite campuses around the world, right? We have NYU in Shanghai, for instance, there are so many parts of this. Um, is what they're teaching the same as students are learning at NYU in New York City? Might not be, I don't know. But um, the credit students get at NYU Shanghai would be received in a different type of institutional setup. So it's equally valuable. So I think your question is, um, is something I address in other parts of my uh, larger book manuscript project. But um, I think when, when, when I was invited to the, um, the conference, I was thinking about how knowledge was produced and what knowledge is and what the Mongols in the Qing was more curious about. If, I don't think Lobsang Sujim and many of the, most of the time Yun Ho Gong has more than 500 monks. Uh, most of them don't really have their name listed in the archives, uh, but what they brought back to their home regions was equally valuable, not because of what the grades they got, it's because they studied at Yun Ho Gong. So I was curious about this kind of social capital that Mongol monks, monks possess after their connection with a particular type of institution. So in a way that whether Yun Ho Gong's monastic setup or their curriculum and their faculty, um, whether it was authentic, it was not the concern that the Mongols had. Uh, that's my argument. I want to see that it's really this kind of different form of value a different system of, a different regime of knowledge production that was more meaningful to them. Um, I, I think I have visited a lot of smaller monasteries in southern Mongolia. Um, they don't really have the strong reference to Tibet, but their reference to Tibetan Buddhism was very sincere, very genuine, and um, their devotion and what they see as valuable uh, was equally justified. So I was trying to understand the difference in terms of that what they received. I, I don't mean to say what they received was inauthentic. I, I feel like that's a different system, and that's what I uh, was hoping to address. And I'm, I, I think I'm joining the conversation about, you know, it's really that the Qing used Tibetan Buddhism to control the Mongols. I deeply believe that's really not the case, but I also want to understand how the Mongols see this internal, uh, this project. So I really felt that it's, it's a cultural production of this different value system that was more meaningful to the Mongols than the political aspect of this whole thing. I hope I address your questions. Thank you. Time for a final question. Thank you very much. Um, this is for Evelyn. I'm writing about Kublai Khan. Um, I'm a student of Morris Rasabi's, and I was very interested because it was my understanding that when Pakpa returned back to Tibet, of course, it was very distressing to Kublai Khan. It was very upsetting that he was losing his friend. It was my understanding that the Sakyas had local rule of Tibet because Tibet was never garrisoned by the Mongols. It may have had later times attacks, but it was never, as with the other parts of empire, it was never garrisoned. And Kublai was projecting what many of the other panelists were talking about earlier, himself as Chakravartin. That's where the, the model came from. So my question is, you were talking about a gift of these territories to Sakya being a fiction. But did that necessarily mean that the Sakyas were not ruling locally Tibet in the way that the Mongols did in all the other parts of the empire, which was the, the local rule with a Mongol center? And then local forms of taxation, local forms of labor conscription, so on and so forth. So did the title to the land, did they have to actually have the title to the land? Or were they ruling and so 
when it changed, when the Sakya fell from grace, there was no question of the title to the land. That's my question. Um, thank you for your question. Um, yeah, that was one thing that I also wanted to say is that I don't think that the, the narrative is a complete fiction. I think that there are some kernels of truth in there and that further research needs to find out what those kernels are that served as you know, the basis for that narrative. Um, I just focused on the, the, the granting of the, chok, the three chok of Tibet and, and this was the, what I found from the text that I had surveyed. Um, and um, yeah, as you, as you mentioned, there, there was a, kind of a structure of administration through the Sakya set up at least in, in central Tibet and also western Tibet and we know a little bit about that. Um, and then the eastern areas too, there were the, the pacification commissions and eastern Tibetan area, uh, the, the Dome Commission was one of the earliest um, to be set up. And, um, um, and there was a census that was done also in the eastern areas and then uh, Pakpa was also granted an estate in Shingun, which, which is in, I think, current day Gansu, so that's eastern Tibet. Um, but then he had his seat at Sakya and then we know that he had, yeah, yeah. Um, well, in the Gyapu Yiksang Chamo, the, the Chinese and Tibetan archives that was written in 1434, um, it mentions that they were three tantras that were specific to the Sakya. And um, I, I, I haven't, I don't, I don't know further uh, what they might be. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. It was great. Thank you.